You need energy. Your cells need glucose for respiration in order to release this energy. But how do you get it? By eating food, of course. If you drink a sugary drink, it will have lots of glucose in it, which goes through your digestive system and gets absorbed into the bloodstream by the villi in your small intestine. These are cells that have a lumpy shape so they have a large surface area, meaning nutrients can be absorbed at a fast rate. Incidentally, this happens by active transport. If you don't know what that is, have a look at my diffusion osmosis and active transport video. Glucose and other nutrients are dissolved in the plasma of your blood, which carries them to every part of your body, providing every cell with what they need for respiration and other functions. But you don't drink Lucozade for breakfast, do you? If you did, you'd be hyper for a short while, but then you'd be crashing by mid-morning, because all of that glucose would have been used up really quickly. Glucose is what we call a carbohydrate. It's a relatively simple one. It's a short molecule. Cereals or toast, however, contain starch. Starch is a long or complex carbohydrate. It's actually a polymer of glucose, or a long chain of glucose molecules bonded together. Because starch molecules are bigger, they can't be absorbed into the bloodstream in the small intestine. So, they need to be broken down into glucose molecules first. How does that happen? Enter enzymes. An enzyme is a special protein that acts as a biological catalyst. A catalyst is just something that helps a reaction take place without being changed itself. They do this by lowering the activation energy needed to get a reaction started. From the moment a piece of bread enters your mouth, an enzyme called amylase, which is in your saliva, starts breaking down starch into glucose. There is an in-between stage too, maltose. It's worth knowing, but the important thing is that it ends up as glucose in the end. There are all sorts of different enzymes. Protease breaks down protein, lipase breaks down fats, and there are some enzymes that even join molecules together. But for now, we'll just think about amylase breaking down starch into glucose as our example. This enzyme acts like a pair of chemical scissors, cutting or breaking the bonds within the starch to leave separate glucose molecules. Now, enzymes are specific to the type of molecule they're breaking down. Amylase can't break down protein and protease can't break down starch. How come? It's all to do with their shape. Enzymes work on a lock and key principle. The molecule to be broken down, we call this the substrate, has a particular shape, just like a key. If it's to be broken down, the enzyme's active site, that's just the part of the enzyme where the business takes place, must be the right shape, just like a lock. If they don't match, nothing will happen. If they do, the substrate bonds to the enzyme, and the enzyme breaks the bonds within the substrate, and the products of the reaction go on their way. In our example, the glucose is now ready to be absorbed into the bloodstream in your small intestine. Sounds like an awful lot of work just to get some energy, doesn't it? But it's a good thing. It takes time for the starch to be broken down, so you get a nice slow and steady supply of glucose entering the bloodstream, so you will have enough energy to keep you going all the way to lunchtime. Just like any chemical reaction, the temperature affects it too. The colder it is, the less kinetic energy the substrate and enzyme have, and the slower they move. They're less likely to meet, and even if they do, there's a lower chance of the collision being a successful one. They might not react. That's why you can't survive in extreme cold for long. It lowers the chances of crucial reactions taking place inside your body, including enzymes working. So hotter is better, right? Well, yes, but actually no. If you increase the temperature, these reactions happen at a faster rate due to the increased kinetic energy, but you get to a point where things start to go wrong and the enzymes seem to stop working. If you put a lock in a furnace for a while, your key isn't gonna fit it anymore, is it? That's because the lock has melted, it's changed shape. And that's also what happens with enzymes. The active site changes shape, so the substrate no longer fits. That's why very hot temperatures are bad for us too. Our enzymes denature, it just means the active site changes shape, and that can be very bad news. But there's a sweet spot where an enzyme works the best, not too hot, not too cold. We call this the optimum temperature. For most enzymes in our bodies, the optimum temperature is 37 degrees Celsius, which is why our bodies work so hard at keeping our internal temperature at around that. The same goes for pH too though. If an enzyme is in too acidic or too alkaline conditions, then it denatures. Amylase has an optimum pH of 7, which is neutral, which makes sense if it's found in our mouths, but pepsin has an optimum pH of 2.5, where do you think you'd find that in your body? There's a couple of experiments you can do to find the optimum temperature and pH of enzymes, and they just differ ever so slightly. Let's see what they'd look like if we used amylase and starch. Let's do the pH version first. One, fill a spotting tile, or two, with iodine. As you might know, iodine turns from orange to black when starch is added. 
Step two, get five test tubes with different pH buffer solutions in each, along with your starch solution. It's usually a couple of centimeters cubed of each, but this depends on the concentrations. Put your first test tube in a water bath and keep the temperature at 30 degrees C. Step three, add the amylase and start your stop clock at the same time. After 10 seconds, use a dropping pipette to take a couple of drops from your mixture and put it on the first spot on your tile. It should turn black because the starch is still there. It hasn't had time to be broken down by the amylase yet. Keep doing this every 10 seconds though and eventually the iodine will stop changing color. Step four, multiply the number of spots it took to get to that point by 10. This gives the total time taken for all of the starch to be broken down. Step five, start again and repeat this whole process for the other pHs. Step six, plot a graph of time taken against pH and draw a line of best fit. You should end up with a curve. The bottom of the curve is at the pH that would have resulted in the shortest time for the starch to be broken down. In other words, the fastest rate of reaction. That could be the optimum pH, but because we can't be sure of what the curve actually looks like, we just say it lies between two of our pHs. The variables would be the following. Independent is the pH. Dependent, time for the reaction to complete or all of the starch to be broken down. Controls are temperature, volume, and concentration of solutions. For the temperature version, we don't need the buffer solutions. We just repeat the experiment for a range of different temperatures by adding hot or cold water to our water bath. Just be aware that our graphs look slightly different to the one earlier, and that's because we have time which is the opposite or reciprocal to rate of reaction. So I hope you found that helpful. If you did, please leave a like and comment down below if you have an idea of what I could do next. See you next time.